Hello, everyone, and welcome to Feature Commentary for The Santa Claus. My name is John Pasquin. I was the director of this film. And my name is Leo Benvenuti. I'm one of the writers on this film. Yeah, and uh, you, you were on set fairly often as well. So, you know, we're not going to count you out on the, uh, the technical side of stuff here. No, I really helped a lot with all aspects of the film. Uh, that was the standard uh, for writers in the 90s. Um, we basically uh, had to do most jobs on film production. Uh, and that has changed since then. But this, this movie's old, as you'll soon see. Yeah, now, now already one of the most important things has happened, which is you see this this typewriter, very office looking font, transform into this this fun font. And that's that's really the entire story of the film, just it, it told through letters. Yeah, actually, I uh, the responsibility of designing this font fell on me as the writer. The uh, the producers were like, hey, you can write these letters, right? And I was too afraid to say no. So, uh, yeah, I, I spent a couple days working on this nice typeface and uh, very proud of my work. And here he comes, the man of the hour, Tim Allen, a guy who I've worked Timothy. with. Yeah, a guy who I have worked with and continue to work with on so many things. I mean, sitcom episodes, uh, other movies, the, the list goes on, folks. Uh, th this man... Yeah, I'm, I'm basically attached to him. I mean, like physically, like right now, like he's he's just in the other room. Like he's just waiting for me to finish this. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> the two of you are uh, incredible. Uh, your professional relationship is like just one of the, the great Hollywood stories. And it's 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 all the more fascinating because the two of you are not friends at all on a personal level. Right. No, no. I, I always like to say that we finish each other's sentences, but it, always incorrectly. Yeah, uh, he'll he'll just cut me off and and say what he thinks I'm going to say, and then I will have to correct him and say no, no, that's not it. Yeah, it's usually actually what he wanted to say. Yeah, but but at the same time, it's one of those things where it's just it's gone on so long that neither of us knows how to really function in the business without the other. Well, that's a good place to be in case, you know, uh, if one of you ever dies, then the other will know that's the time to retire. Yeah, or die. You know, frankly, I, yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't know what to do. A lot of actors die on the same day as their directors absolutely absolutely i mean just look at hitchcock um you know oh oh did you see that oh, little it, there's my credit now speaking yeah. of fucked up uh sorry s screwed up professional relationships uh me and steve rudnick we don't really talk anymore we used to write all the uh we used to we wrote space jam together we wrote this we were best of friends but um well maybe i'll, I'll get into the story a little bit later but uh, what were you gonna say well, th there's a little hint there. There's, there's a little girl with the... Uh, well, people say it's elf ears. That's not true at all. Mm -hmm. um, we never got a chance to get into this, and your script had a, a bit more about it. But there was, there was going to be humans and elves and then goblins, and she was going to be a mm -hmm. goblin, and the goblins are sort of the enemies of Christmas. But uh, we didn't really have time to get into that. No, and I... I, you know, me and, uh, that was more of a, that was a Steve Rudnick thing. He really wanted to put goblins in these movies. We actually wrote all three, uh, of the original, uh, run of these movies. We didn't write the, the further expanded universe sequels that came after, but the, the golden trio of Santa Claus one, two, and X, um, that was all us. Yeah. And you directed them as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, geez, it's it's all a blur. It almost feels like one film. So I'm going to be I'm going to try not to get them all confused and start talking about Martin Short in this one or you know, know. the scene yeah. that we cut out of uh, Laurence Olivier uh, or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people. So, yeah, I wrote this uh, this kind of family dynamic. Oh. Yeah. No, I was going to say people were uh, you, you were on the same page here. People really uh, praised us for the portrayal of this family dynamic. So it, you, you take it from there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I wanted to have uh I wanted Tim Allen to be in a uh in a relationship with uh his ex-wife and her uh new husband, the uh character of Neil played by uh the wonderful Judge Reinhold. Uh unfortunately Tim Allen and Disney uh kind of weren't into that idea. They wanted to make them more of a a divorced kind of uh you know, he's just there to help out monetarily kind of situation and uh that's what we ended up going with uh, a lot of the the love was removed from our original screenplay concept and uh that actually works i think in the film's favor because it gives him more of a uh, an arc to develop yeah which is a shame because you know it, most people seem to praise this film for the, the the family dynamic of portraying divorce. But I remember I got mm-hmm. a bunch of letters when this came out and people were disappointed because they said, I remember when I was younger and my parents got divorced and then my dad dated my mom and her new husband again. And people were disappointed that we weren't able to, you know, reflect their reality on screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I wrote the stairs as being carpeted in the original screenplay, and I'm really happy that that detail made it uh, into your vision. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, the the ha- I'd say about half of the production went into picking just the right stairs. Like you would be surprised. Mm-hmm how a set of stairs can change the entire tone of a film. You know, we'd look we'd look at one set of stairs, we'd be like, oh no, now we've got a horror movie, and then another set of stairs, yeah. and we'd be like, well, well, these are hand-drawn. This is going to make it look like a cartoon, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, but in the end, we, we nailed the stairs. Yeah, we sure did. I think so. Uh, okay, now here's the big, the dinner scene. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, the the way that we filmed this, uh, we actually filmed it in reverse, uh, which, which is how they do food commercials and whatnot. Like, if you ever see any fast food commercials, you know, that, that to make it look, you know, more real than real, uh, they, they, they yes. film it in reverse, and then they reverse that footage, and it just looks, it reflects reality a little bit more. Now, if you look throughout this film, there are uh, hidden Santa Clauses throughout. Um, in fact, we just had one for a brief oh. second. Yeah, we just had one for a brief second. And the flash of the flames there for a moment, you could actually see Santa poking his head out of the stove. So uh, obviously we're uh, we're not going to go back and stop because that'll throw off our timing of recording. But you, you can do that on your own time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely recommend just scrubbing through the movie. Uh, pretty much, there's always a Santa Claus in frame, especially later in the film when he becomes Santa Claus. But uh, even early on at this point, you know, uh, you can see the car uh, run over Santa Claus at several times and um, single frames where Santa Claus's face will appear and then disappear. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this has become a holiday tradition for many families, and uh, most people watch the film just all the way through normal speed. But I know a number of families that actually do a bit of an advent calendar each and every year where they will look at a single frame uh, a day uh, for 25 days of Christmas of the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next year they will resume where they left off. And it's it's uh, it's great to see that people are really, really examining the film and finding all of the little details that we put in. Yeah, that that translates to a little over a second a year of the film. Right. And uh, so basically. uh, It would take you multiple lifetimes to get through the whole thing, but I guess that's the that's the holiday fun of it, isn't it? Right, right. And the idea is that you will then pass on the film to your kids and their kids. And um, eventually they'll figure out what the film looks like just through oral tradition. And Mm -hmm. I just think that's beautiful that the legacy carries on that way. Now, I remember this day on set, these big red candles were a huge problem, right? (laughs) Were they ever? Um, So first of all, one of the candles turned out to be a stick of dynamite. So obviously yeah, after 
Yeah, after we set that off, uh, we had to, you know, pick up all the debris and remove the corpses and mm-hmm. uh, reset things. Um, so that that put us behind schedule by a few minutes. Yeah, that's why you don't want to use any of the, the really old prop houses in L.A. Uh, they have a lot of old timey, uh, you know, dynamite and, uh, you know, dangerous X-ray equipment in those those warehouses. And you never know what you're going to get. So, yeah. And, and a lot of that out. St- a lot of that stuff is stolen as well. I mean, the, the original directors, they were really just criminals that would really just rob people and then uh, just put their things in front of a camera and just film them and oftentimes uh, hold them for a ransom. You know, the, mm-hmm. the entirety of Citizen Kane is actually just a long ransom note. Um, saying, look, I, I have all your things. I have your house. You have to pay me to get it back. And uh, it, it failed, of course. Uh, you know, that, that movie lost money. But uh, uh, the practice still exists today. I think, uh, you know, I stole uh, a couple, um, couple shirts for this movie. Really nothing too flashy. It's all, you know, you're pretty late, limited by guild regulations these days. But uh, yeah, we, we still do like to steal props here and there from uh, just regular ordinary people. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the union has rules that you can't steal things that uh, amount to more than a million dollars per film. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, we, we've managed throughout the years to steal a bunch of things. And of course, the rules for theft are different for television. So I, I won't get into that. Yeah. Now, here we're we're establishing the lure of Santa Claus. Now, we were we were very, very concerned that people wouldn't know who Santa Claus was. Uh, We weren't sure if people knew the mythology. And so we 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 inserted the scene um, to really, really spell it out for people who weren't familiar with the character of Santa Claus. Yeah, it's I mean, you forget now because, you know, Santa's all over to TV and movies and music videos. But for a few decades, probably from the 50s until the 90s, Santa Claus was really out of fashion and uh, nobody really uh, knew uh, what his deal was until uh, I I won't take full credit for it. But uh, we were definitely part of the bringing Santa back movement of the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you saw, you know, zines that got passed around the 80s. It, it was a it was mm-hmm. a small, dedicated cult following that yeah, uh, kind of we, an underground Santa thing. Yeah. Yeah. We really made mainstream. And some of those fans from back then are, 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 are some of them are grateful that we brought it to the masses and some are very upset that uh, we, I'd say uh, it's sold I'd say out 90 percent upset because of what we did to the Santa image and lore in this movie but you know what i mean it, you really have to clean it up for for disney and you know for mainstream audiences and that's just uh what we had to do yeah so well i think most people know the plot of this film by now so i'm i'm gonna give my reading here so this is sure. this is thematically what i was going for this is a reverse vampire story you know typically vampire They essentially kill you. You become them. Right. And here uh, he's about to kill Santa and become him. So it's 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 a reverse vampire story and you stay young forever as a vampire. And in here, he's going to be old forever. Until someone kills him, uh, presumably. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be frank, that's not my intention in the screenplay, but I remember you uh, pitching this idea, this this concept to me and uh, feeling that like, yeah, this totally fits. Santa's death scene here is actually really close to how uh, Dracula dies in the original Bram Stoker book. Mm-hmm. And um, I uh, I can totally see the reverse parallels that uh, that you brought to the film. Right. And like a, a vampire has like longer canine teeth. Right. So we, we went in yeah. and we digitally shrunk uh, Tim Allen's canines just a bit. You know, again, reverse vampire. Uh, reverse vampire. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tim has incredibly long uh, canine teeth in real life and a uh, huge problem on the home improvement set. But this film, uh, yeah, this was one of the first 
digital tooth shortening films. I think Pacific Data Images uh, uh, were, uh, you know, on that particular task. And I think it's pretty seamless. I think it holds up. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too much into uh, home improvement, but uh, we used to call him Mr. Walrus uh, because of how long <laughs> his canines were. <laughs> I, yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, in the tabloids, yeah, they love that yeah. name. Okay, so here's here's Santa waving goodbye. Not dead. Yes. Um. Not dead. Not dead. Uh. So the question is, you know, what what happens if he's waving goodbye? What really happens to him? I it, well, in my in the original script. And the script that I turned in and expected to be filmed, uh, he was explicitly dead. No mm -hmm. doubt about it. His face was visible. You could see, you know, the life had left Santa's eyes. And uh, I, th you filmed it that way. And test audiences didn't like it. They didn't like uh, Tim Allen's kind of uh, callous reaction to the death of a man. And um, this was kind of the compromise, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we we also thought about just but right before the scene, just having a naked Santa just run away like mm -hmm. I'm free, you know, like the curse is the outfit itself, you know. And once he fell off of the roof, that sort of broke the bond with the suit, you know, because it was like physically very rigidly attached to him and it sort of snapped Sort yeah. of like, you know, like breaking open a clamshell or something. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I I mean, uh, a lot of this is uh, just sort of in like the movie Bible. It doesn't make it to the screen. But yeah, there are um, there's small uh, living fibers on the inner side of the Santa suit that uh, kind of attach and burrow into your skin. Yeah. Now, one big thing that we introduced here in the Santa lore is the Santa ladder. And it warms mm -hmm. my heart now every year, you know, around the holidays to see people put out their ladder for Santa Claus. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that is directly, you know, attributed to this film and its contribution to to Christmas traditions is, uh, you know, people uh, purchasing solid gold ladders, climbing up every year, falling off their roof in a, you know, loving tribute to the film. And um yeah, it uh, really warms my heart and, you know, gives me a little chuckle to see that, uh, you know, happening on my own street every year. Yeah. Now, I remember I got so much criticism. People were saying, oh, the reindeer look fake. Those are fake reindeer. Let me set mm -hmm. the record straight. And I've said this many times before, and I'm sure I'll have to say it again. Those are real reindeer covered yeah in puppetry and animatronic. So underneath all of that, there is a real live reindeer. OK, but you can only get them to cooperate so much. So we covered them in fur and attach animatronic eyes over their eyes. Yeah, that's the story. And I'm it's a story I'll have to tell maybe my whole life. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'll never forget it. I was responsible for, you know, like fitting a lot of those animatronics uh, as the writer. And, uh, I mean, part of the reason was that just, uh, real life reindeer aren't good actors. Uh, they're very small and, uh, uh, unhealthy looking and it just didn't read well on camera. Yeah. Now, unlike, uh, polar bears, polar bears are great actors. We were thinking yes. about having this where we sort of changed up the lore a bit and, uh, Santa had eight uh beautiful beautiful polar bears but mm -hmm. uh we just didn't have the budget we could only get seven polar bears and it just looked uneven and we decided uh you know go go with uh what the zines are saying go with the reindeer yeah that's one of the cases where like although yeah in real life santa claus actually used polar bears yeah yeah we all know mm -hmm. but um but you know just you know use your imagination a reindeer they just work better yeah. Some more just remembering some more letters that I got, which was mm -hmm. uh, people were accusing us. They said, you killed him. You killed Santa. And I just I wrote back to every single person and I said, of course, we didn't kill Santa. Santa was already murdered by the mafia. Like everyone knows that or at least everyone in Hollywood knows that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's a uh, something I had to research actually for the script was basically you know, Santa's involvement with the mafia back in the 1930s. And I, I actually, I uh, never sold it, but I wrote a, a second screenplay uh, that kind of got more into that mm -hmm. world. Um, and it was, you know, not what I set out to do. It was more just like there was so much good material there and Santa's dealings with Capone and all those uh, fun characters. But, uh, uh, you know, in the end, Disney wasn't interested in, a, you know, a mafia movie at this point in, in their, uh, you know, nowadays they'd make it, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, mid 90s, you know, this was a Tim Allen project. Nobody wanted to see uh, Santa get gunned down or anything. So, uh, yeah, that's been sh on the shelf for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Uh, do you remember the first Santa suit that we had on set? Uh, that thing took, I remember, like in real time, it took about five hours for him to put on. There was. A, yeah, it a, was something like. 400 yeah. pounds right yeah it was 400 pounds it was just layers and layers of buttons and zippers it was it was almost like a puzzle to put the thing on yeah. it was impressive uh but it, it just uh, what was it it was uh the costuming department told me it was sixty thousand different like closures uh, on it whether it be hooks or again zippers buttons um, some parts had to just be glued on. So he would actually, he actually took what we called the, the Santa glue out of his pocket to glue, uh, certain flaps and other parts of it together. Yeah. And the, ultimately the problem with that costume wasn't really the weight or the complexity. It was the fact that it left his genitals completely exposed. And, uh, the first cut of the movie, uh, that aspect wasn't popular. So we went with uh, the, the simplified suit ultimately. Yeah, which made it hard because we had already filmed all of the scenes uh, referencing the fact now, that those genitals scene, the were exposed. The dog was supposed to bite him, Kurt. Yeah, the, the dog oh, was sorry. supposed to bite him. But uh, Tim, yeah. Tim Allen actually just kept talking in dog language. Like he and we kept saying, no, 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 you're the dog is recognizing you as one of his own. You can't do that. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, but it's it's so instinctual for Tim. I mean, he sees a dog and he talks to it in its own language. And mm -hmm. and so we tried to get him to say something mean in dog language. And he was like, well, I, I don't know any mean things to say. All I know how to say is like, I love you and I'm going to give you some bacon well, it was a, in general, it was kind of a huge problem getting Tim to speak in English in this film, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, dog is his native language, so he would just yeah. slip into it constantly, like in the middle of a scene, in the middle of a line, like he would just, he'd be like, all right, now we're going to go, rawr, 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 and I'd have to say, cut, 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 Tim, you're doing it again. And then he'd go, rawr, 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 and then I'd say, you're talking in dog. You know, he didn't even realize, even when I said cut. So that's the way that went. <sighs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of overdubbing. I remember him doing probably about half the footage we, we, we got. He'd be speaking in his, his uh, Tim Allen dog language, and uh, we'd kind of have to go in and, you know, adjust his mouth, which we were doing anyway because of the teeth shortening effect. So it, it actually didn't cost that much money to to fix his uh lip sync yeah now this uh movie introduces the idea of how does santa get into your house if you don't have a chimney mm -hmm. and uh this isn't originally how we were going to do that uh he was just gonna come in through the front door he was gonna have his finger actually be a key and a skeleton key if you will uh, because he would have a skeleton hand and he would shove that yes. skeleton hand into the front door and go in. And then he would then brick by brick build a fireplace. And once he had that fire built, he would then shove his hand into the fire, which would then cause flesh to grow over his skeleton hand. And then he would use that now fleshed hand to put presents underneath the tree. But it took too long. Yeah, yeah, it just it, it, another thing that we had to cut. I mean, you know, the the five hour version of this that we had originally 
was a masterpiece. I don't know why they won't let us put it out. I'm sorry, Disney. Like, you know, I know you've got your standards, but people have been asking for it for years. But we had to cut a lot of things out, as you might imagine, to get to this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, so uh, you, you want to tell them how we did the kayak coming out of the bag trick, or do you want me to? Uh, I mean, the way I remember it was uh, we had um, a, a kind of um, a couple of our, um, I guess, prop makers, you'd call them, uh, inside the bag, and they were just building the boat as it came out. Right, 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 yeah. Uh, that, we found that was the easiest way to do it. All right, so let's let's talk about uh, computer generated images here, because uh, that's another thing that we got, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of flack for. Technically speaking, we didn't use computers for any of this. The way that you do this, the way that you manipulate mm -hmm. the images, okay, is you have the, these these frames of the film and they're printed out very very large and they're very very soft okay and yep. what we do is we very carefully by hand push the image around like stretch this part here stretch part this part there and so it looks like certain things are happening so yes when we filmed it santa sleigh wasn't there we were just filming these clouds okay but what you do is you take a little bit of the cloud and you smush it here and you smush it there and you push it here and bada bing, bada boom, you got yourself a sleigh full of reindeer. So it's got yeah. nothing to do with computers. It's all manual. It's man labor. Yeah. Aside from the teeth, which was a computer effect. Right. Asi aside from that. But you know, that, that was a different department. I mean, everyone knows when you when you make a film, Right. You do you do the sound, you do the score, you do oh, the overdubbing, all that stuff. And then it gets sent out to the teeth department. And that is a whole other thing. Yeah. And they spend weeks, sometimes years on a film uh, just editing the teeth. And we we in the union, we in Hollywood have no say in what they do. None whatsoever. No, totally different. All right. Now, this is our first elf, right? This is our first elf, not unlike a goblin that we saw. And uh, we filmed this on set at the actual North Pole. So this is at the northernmost uh, part of the world. And ironically, not snowing that day. Wouldn't you know it? Uh, so we had to do artificial snow. Now you can see it's not melting, it's artificial, because it's just bone shavings. I mean, old industry trick, it's all just bone shavings coming down from the sky. Oh, yeah. What you do is you take the bones from the previous film you worked on, uh, and then you just shave them down, and that's a, uh, you know, real, uh, you know, good use of uh, old bones. Mm-hmm. Now, the way I envisioned uh, the North Pole in my in my head and in our, the original script, um, the elves, I I didn't see them as children like they are in this. Uh, I envisioned them as uh, adult men. Um, just, uh, you know, as tall or even taller than Tim Allen and um I uh, really, you know, I had, I had a whole list of uh, adult male actors in mind for playing all these elves, and I wanted them to all be huge stars. I wanted a just all star cast of of uh, of men playing the elves, and uh, I think it was just not feasible, right? They cost more. Yeah, yeah. The the great thing about hiring children is mm -hmm. you know you you hire actors by the pound you know uh by their yeah. weight and so the the lighter they are the less it's going to cost for you to make your film and so having a whole bunch of adult extras all over the place oof you know that's that's going to cost a pretty penny but having oh, these yeah. these 
awful just half people or children as some people call them um that that saved us some some money ultimately uh craft services alone i mean like grilled cheese sandwiches and fish sticks it's way cheaper than the stuff that uh you know the likes of uh sir Lawrence olivier and uh you know uh who else who else did we almost hire i think robert de niro was going to be one of the background elves at one point yeah just Ar- guys who eat a lot yeah you know? arnold schwarzenegger you know sylvester yeah. stallone like uh, i remember a lot of like action stars were going to be in this and you know uh not in a funny way not in the like oh look at this big tough guy being an elf like we were going to no. have them like very sincerely be elves and, you know, not in ridiculous costumes or anything like they were going to be very serious about it. And we're going to explain that it's it's hard to be an elf. You know, it it does take a lot of physical prowess and a lot of strength. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I think we did get to explore this a little in the sequels, but the uh, idea of adult male elves and their costumes were were going to be uh, a little bit more Hellraiser inspired. There would have been a lot of black leather and and uh, hooks and stuff. Um, I, yeah, I think it would have been a more interesting direction to go in, but we wouldn't have gotten Bernard, who is uh, a wonderful sort of half child elf. Yeah, yeah. Another thing we we had to cut out uh, the fact that he is half child and half elf. Um, we didn't really get into the whole backstory and how his parents, you know, broke the treaty between elves and humans by creating him and how, uh, you know, the universe will end in 10,000 years because of his existence. Uh, we, we, we mm-hmm. didn't get into any of that. Just another thing that got cut for time. Oh yeah. But, uh, great working with the wonderful eric uh eric david frank david crumholtz yes got there um he uh brought a lot of fun to the north pole set he uh actually most of these toys came from his personal collection Mm, yeah he had a fantastic collection of toys some of which we had to uh remove from set they the disney didn't find them appropriate not because they weren't disney properties but because they Mm. were literal guns like like not toy guns just you know literal like ar-15s and that sort of thing yeah that was uh, yeah in addition to thousands and thousands of uh, actual wonderful toys that he brought uh you know from his set he also just happened to have a lot of dangerous weapons uh just mixed in for some reason so uh, you know that basically we lost only a day of day shooting you know just removing uh knives and uh and uh you know guns and and uh swords yeah i i think it, and uh medieval yeah go on yeah i was just gonna say i think if you look carefully you can see some of them in the background like i, I think we missed a few mm-hmm. yeah now this is the uh the titular santa claus i remember this was a huge huge problem uh in the uh promotional materials and just the the public accepting this film um was the 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 kind of misunderstanding uh people would uh ask tim allen say you know like oh okay so you played the santa claus and uh you know tim especially would have a huge problem with that be like i guess you haven't watched the fucking movie because if you did you'd know that the santa claus is the titular clause in the santa claus contract that i had to sign to become santa claus there's no the in front of his name and uh it really hurt the uh, the initial ticket sales of this movie because of the controversy yeah i remember we had to put billboards up that very carefully explained no, there is no E at the end of the person and it doesn't say, you know, it doesn't have the title of the it's it's Santa Claus, no E and then the Santa Claus E. And there was billboards all over explaining this uh, because the whole thing just got out of control. Yeah. Who was the pro- uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, the president of Disney uh, at the time um, had to basically uh go on 
uh, ABC Live one night and just uh, explain, you know, that the Santa Claus is the name of the clause, you know, the contractual clause. Mm -hmm. And Santa Claus, no the, eh, it was just a huge disaster. But luckily, everyone got it. They learned a new word and uh, they all, you know, once once they understood the basic premise, they they turned out and uh, the film was actually a success. Uh, but it was a, it was like a full month after Christmas. It was really just a, a huge hit in January for, for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going back to that, I just, I remember there was a craze of people just looking at the borders of things, just being convinced that there was hidden clauses that they had accidentally agreed to. Like anything at all that had a border that looked like it might be words, people would just run away from it. They'd just say, no, I, I, I don't want to be Santa Claus. You can't make me. You can't make me agree to this. Yeah, actually, it was a problem with the ticket sales. Right. It's one reason nobody wanted to see it. They didn't want to become Santa Claus. Right, right. So here we have more of the toys that we borrowed. And uh, I remember they all smelled awful. Like they just reeked, reeked, reeked. It, it, they just smelled like, I guess, cow manure. I mean, I haven't spent that much time around cows, but I, I guess I would say it smelled like cow manure. And we asked, why did these smell so bad? And I, I remember... I was told in 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 not so many words, oh, uh, global warming. Yeah, I uh, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why they smelled so bad. I think uh, maybe uh, the answer you got was a bit of a of a brush off. But uh, the impression I got was was just that uh, David Crumholtz also had a lot of cows in his house. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have been that. And that would also explain all of the weapons, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so. so the, oh, go on. No, I was just going to say they, they have all of those pictures on the wall there. And you can't really see them that well. But those are all pictures of Tim Allen eating celery. Um, mm -hmm. he, he actually brought that from his home. Uh, not a lot of people know this, but every time Tim Allen has a piece of celery, he, he makes sure that he photographs himself eating them. Uh, he, he loves to memorialize eating celery, uh, which is a food he hates. He despises it. Uh, so when he when he does eat it, it's really an event for him. Mm hmm. All right. So here we have a view of what we what we interpreted from your your script to be what the North Pole would look like. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you think we got it right? I think so. And it's really wonderful. This is not a matte painting. This is actually just the view of the window outside the uh, the Hollywood studio that this was filmed in. Um, just, uh, yeah, Hollywood happened to look a lot like the North Pole at this time. Um, and uh, I don't know, it was just a really wonderful, lucky thing. Oh, what's that? Oh, that is, uh, that's Tim Allen trying to get in. Uh, he knows we're recording. Tim, I'm, we're fine. We're fine. Stay, I'm sorry. He's, he's making sad eyes. He's making his puppy dog face. Tim, Tim, I told you, we'll go get frozen mayo after this. Oh. He can't get enough yeah. of frozen mayonnaise. It's his favorite snack. Yeah, you know what? You tell him that he already got to do his own commentary track for this film for the, uh, you know, the uh, 2003 DVD. Uh, and uh, it was a disaster. Whole thing is in dog language. No one could understand it. So uh, too bad, Tim. Yeah, it was also only five minutes long. So they just, they just looped it. Yeah, you got to yeah. stick around. Yeah, mm -hmm. the man has no patience. No, look, he's a he's a fine actor. He's a fine comedian, but he's not a commentary track guy. No, he uh, sadly he is not. Well, and that's fine. That's fine. 
Now, now remember, this is the big waking up scene. Yeah, and I remember the executives just wanted him to just wake up, and now he's Santa. They're like, enough is enough. We've dragged this out. Let's just cut to the chase. Blanket comes off. He's Santa. And we had to fight nah, and say, no, there's there's more things that have to happen. No, I mean, that's, yeah, that's screenwriting 101 there. Don't have your character become Santa before the halfway mark of the movie. Mm-hmm. You got to drag it out. You got to make it gradual. You got to tease the little Santa details. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. And in the end, I think uh, I think they recognized that. Yeah. We can't just pull a Dr. Zhivago where in the first five mm-hmm. minutes he becomes Santa. You know, that's you, you can't do that these days. No. You get it's got to be more uh, the fly 1986. Mm, yeah, which which was a huge influence uh, on me. I don't know about you, but that film was a huge influence on me. Definitely. In fact, I really wanted Jeff Goldblum in this part. But uh, Tim, who's still making puppy dog eyes in front of the recording booth. Um, I'm not <laughs> letting you in, Tim. You got to wait. Uh, Tim really insisted uh, that he be attached to this project. I mean, he he held my daughter hostage and I, I needed her back honestly, because she was the only one who knew where the, the good spoons were, you know? Yeah. Well, at the time I I remember his, uh, his management, his agent was telling us like, Tim's got to be in this movie. He's a huge Santa fan. He is just been a huge proponent of Santa Claus, his whole career. He has all the all the zines, all the old Santa advertising materials. And then uh, once we hired him, first day of shooting, he said, all right, who the hell is Santa Claus? What's this movie about? So uh, that was a lie. I don't know why he wanted to do the movie so much. Yeah, yeah. So, um, he, you know, he was he kept asking, who's this Santa guy? So I was like, all right, I'll show you. And we went to the local mall. You know, they had Santa mm-hmm. Claus there having, you know, little kids sit on his lap. And so I pointed to him and I said, Tim, that's him. That's Santa. And Tim went, oh, my God, I'm fired. That man has my career now. And we said, no, 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 he's playing the same part. And he just flew into a rage and he said, I'm not sharing billing with this asshole. And he he just came, went over to that guy and just beat the shit out of him. And the kids were crying and crying and And finally, we explained to him, Tim, you just murdered that man. So now you have his part. And and Tim said, good, I'm glad. And that sort of settled it. Yeah. And the I think in the end, I think that was kind of just his actor's process. I think that really helped him get into the role, having killed another performer in that role. And I. I've seen him pull the same trick, I believe um, he uh he he at least gravely injured an astronaut before taking the role of buzz lightyear Mm. and um i believe he attacked some amish people for that movie where he plays some sort of man who goes to an amish village right got the title yeah did you direct that uh i started to direct it and they didn't like where i was going with it it was i was gonna set it in the future which I thought would make Mm -hmm. it more interesting because, you know, oh, it's the future and we've got flying cars, but oh no, the Amish are still the Amish. And um, they just weren't on board with that. So they, they, they found a loophole in my contract and uh, I ended up in prison. Uh, But uh, yeah. (sighs) Well, I don't know if you ever uh, saw the whole movie, but uh, they ended up kind of using your idea in the end. So I don't know what that's all about. Uh, that film, it takes place in the present, but the Amish have advanced technology in that movie. Well, p- part of the uh, the terms of my parole, which I'm still on, is I'm not allowed to watch the film. So I, I, I really couldn't mm-hmm. say. Well, you're not missing much. Right. Uh, now, this scene was not in the screenplay and not in the original cut of the movie. And I think it was added uh, for digital streaming. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, In fact, this, that man is not an actor. He just uh, wandered in and started saying just horrible things, horrible things. Thankfully, the end of his 
just ranting monologue about the government and the women that had wronged him uh, was, you know, uh, a little bit less scary. And it sort of made him seem like, you know, he was just a normal fireman. So we 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 were able to uh, oh, they were able to salvage it for this version. Yeah, they yeah, you weren't present for this uh, reshoot, but um. I, yeah, I, I read an article about it. And it was very interesting. They got, uh, you know, Tim Allen and all the actors back t- for the scene, you know, like 25 years later. And uh, they used a lot of makeup and only makeup in order to make them all young, especially Eric Lloyd here, who is uh, at this point 40 something years old. But uh, he doesn't look a day over eight. Right. And uh, some of that was achieved through drastic uh, plastic surgery as well. I mean, they had to basically cut off uh, his legs right at the knees uh, in order for him to achieve his former height when he originally mm-hmm. filmed this. And that was his idea. That's dedication. He really wanted to be in this new scene. Yeah, absolutely. He said, please, this is all I have. Please let me be a boy again. I'm begging you. Everything's been terrible since then. I just need a moment to be a boy again, please. Yeah. All these kids are actually adults who opted to be turned into children again. All right, well, the scene's over. Yeah. Now, uh, it's a shame that we weren't able to rig up the doll that Tim Allen has the way that we wanted to, because the original concept was that the elves were controlling the doll. And so they were going to have the doll talk and walk around And really just tell everyone, hey, look, this man is Santa Claus. And just really just go around the room, just breaking things, just just screaming. He is Santa Claus. He is Santa Claus. He is Santa Claus. Yeah, but uh, in the end, that was not really necessary. It turned out people understood that he is Santa Claus. Uh, They're just smarter than we gave him credit for. So we didn't need the the doll to explain the plot points in the end. And uh, that's good because the animatronics for the doll were just uh, not working too well anyway. No, no, the the eyes just kept bleeding and we didn't know Mm -hmm. where the blood was coming from, but the eyes just kept just oozing this endless stream of thick red blood. Yeah. Uh, There's, there's a polar bear. Of course, uh, some more frame manipulation, of course, you know, we see right between his legs there and you can imagine, you know, what we, uh, what we had to remove for the final version. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, this looks like it's filmed at the aquarium, but if I recall correctly, this is actually an airport that we uh, flooded. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we just didn't have time to tell people to leave. So we, we just started to fill it up with water and we figured people would get the hint. And most of them did. I mean, uh, the, the polar bear attacks, I'd say, were were minimal. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, actually, I remember a lot of the victims uh, just kind of shrugging and saying, not again. So I don't think it was a big deal in the end. Yeah, not, not at all. You know, uh, a lot of them actually saw the film later on and said, oh, that's what that was for, you know, and then they they sort of limped out. Hey, the reindeer. Now, this actress, Wendy Crewson, who plays mom in this movie, mm-hmm. um, uh, she did not get along with uh, the child or Tim Allen. Uh, and I remember uh, she uh, mixed them up a lot. She couldn't really tell the difference between the two of them, Eric Lloyd and, and Tim Allen. Yeah, she's got a rare disorder where she doesn't see height. She sees everyone and everything at the same height. Um, mm-hmm. So she she was just she was just baffled all the time. And then she would go to complain to me or who she thought was me. And it was just a tree. And then she would say, why are you being so quiet? And um, why are there squirrels living in you? Pretty, yeah, pretty big problem there. But uh, yeah, we were able to get through the shoot okay. Mm, uh, we're yeah. all professionals. Yeah. Judd Reinhold. Now, he was great to be around. 
Yeah. And uh, he was he was really into debunking Santa Claus. I mean, even before this film, it was really uh, a hobby of his. He really he he did a lecture circuit going around and around explaining to people how Santa Claus was scientifically impossible, um, which is funny because in real life, he is a big believer in Santa Claus. But it, it just, you know, it's a hobby of his of just trying to debunk Santa Claus, just trying to poke holes in what he sees as a, you know, a solid argument. And a really? Fact. Yeah, like a, an intellectual exercise, basically. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Devil's advocate. And I believe I, I believe that's why he took the role in this film is so that he could continue to talk about Santa Claus on the talk show circuit and, and uh, you know, offer his, uh, his theories as to why Santa Claus couldn't exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, with the photographs of, you know, the the proof of Santa's non-existence, you know. Here's a picture of Santa Claus not being here. Here's another picture that isn't Santa Claus, you know. And uh, I remember he, uh, he used to get a lot of um, people would take his word as a legally binding fact because his first name is Judge. Mm, yeah. Uh, which is, which is just a... Uh, his his actor name, like his Hollywood name, his stage name, if you will, is his actual name is actually President Reinhold. That is his legal name. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of people know that. That's not that big of a secret. Yeah. Well, pretty much every actor has to take a new name. Mm, right, right, right. What was Tim Allen's original name? Uh, Kapolsky. K- uh, Polsky Allen. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is a heartbreaking scene because this was the last anyone ever saw of this park where we shot. Um, It immediately sunk down into the ground right after we were done filming and flames just started shooting out of the the sinkhole. And uh, to this day, they say if you look down into it, you, you go insane. It's true. And I remember actually now that you mentioned that I remember Tim Allen brought a lot of chemicals to set and uh, between takes would spend time just pouring out the chemicals into the ground at this park. Yeah. And uh, it was later that night that the whole thing sunk. So I wonder if there's any connection. I don't know. Um, He was also uh, chanting things in what sounded like Latin while he was doing it. I, I don't know if that's related, but well, I don't oh, know. okay. I didn't realize it was Latin. I thought it was just, uh, you know, his, you know, his signature dog woof. Uh, it, I mean, it could have been, it could have been dog Latin, come to think of it. Mm. So, I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, Sony, we got a pretty yep. penny from Sony for putting that insert shot, and we really put yeah, Sony actually, on the map. You still have that penny, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. It is gorgeous. Uh, it, uh, it got penny of the year, um, a few years actually in a row. Nice. Oh, look at that beard. Did a great job on that beard. Yep. Here we go. Now, what I wanted to do was have him actually be pregnant with the new Santa Claus. And so he would eventually give birth to the new Santa. So, you know, sort of a, a red herring. Oh, you think he's becoming fat like Santa, but no, he, he is gestating Santa within him. Yeah. And then by the time Santa's ready to come out, he, the, the old Tim Allen is just kind of like a, a dead shell that just kind of flops off. And the new Tim Allen Santa Claus is underneath. Yeah, exactly. But once again, Disney said, no, please stop bringing us these ideas. We're begging you. We're already about to go bankrupt with, you know, the the castle that you built that you never used. Please, please just stick to the script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just slightly too much money to do that. So that's why they said no. Yeah. But wow, that uh, that castle that we had built was was gorgeous. And it was even more gorgeous when we just blew the whole thing up. I mean, that was a great shot. But, you know, we forgot to bring cameras that day. So that was that. Yeah, you know what? We still got to watch a, a castle blow up, so yeah, I wasn't upset. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, ah, Peter Boyle is in this movie, of course. Oh, of course. I mean, he is he's incredible. And uh, he this was his uh, 48th Santa film. And he said, is this the one? Is this finally the one where I get to play Santa Claus? And we couldn't break his heart. We said yes. So basically all the scenes where Tim Allen is dressed as Santa, we had to then say, okay, Tim, now go hide. And Peter Boyle would come in and go, ho, ho, ho. And, you know, do the whole scene thinking that he was the star of the film. And then came the awkward day where we premiered the film. And he's all excited thinking that he is going to be the star of the film, right? So Mm -hmm. he comes in the theater and I had a a jar of acid and I said, hey, Peter, you want to see my jar of acid? And he said, well, okay, I've already seen it, but I'll look at it again. And that's when we threw the acid in his eyes and he screamed and he screamed and he screamed. And we said, do you you need to go to the hospital? And he said, no, I want to hear myself as Santa Claus. And then we realized that the audio really didn't match up with his idea of, you know, him being the star of it. So then we poured some acid onto his ears and we said, Peter, can you hear us? And he just kept screaming and screaming. And we realized that we would get away with our, our little uh, bait and switch. That's how that happened. Oh yeah. And uh, nobody seemed to mind his uh, screaming and stomping around and, and throwing popcorn because, uh, if you've ever ever been to a movie premiere with Peter Boyle, you know, that's pretty much, uh, you know, that's the standard, you know, so <laughs> that worked out. Yeah, you, you can scratch that off your movie premiere bingo card if uh, Peter Boyle's involved. That's the center square. <laughs> Lovely actor, though. Oh, great guy. Uh, and uh, not dead, uh, despite uh, the rumors and the reports. He's fine. Yeah, he's yeah, he's still uh, acting. Yeah. Just keeps it a little bit private, but yeah, he's, uh, I believe, yeah, he did vines for a long time and then, uh, I think he's on TikTok now. Yeah. Yeah. Now in, in my script, my, my idea for having uh, Tim Allen's character be a toy company executive, um, actually was, a. Uh, an unintentional parallel with Santa Claus and the fact that he makes toys. I remember uh, when the reviews came out, they all pointed out at how clever it was that, oh, you know, he makes toys for a living and then he becomes Santa Claus. And I kind of had to pretend like that was my intent the the whole time. And uh, nope, I just want to come out, come clean, say, no, I didn't. I didn't put two and two together. It's just one of those things that happens in writing. Yeah, I, I, I believe what you did when you were writing it, right? You just... Uh, saw this guy walking down the street and he said, hey, what do you do for a living? And he's like, oh, I, I work at a toy company. And you're like, good enough. Thanks, man. Yeah. Now, my writing po- uh, my writing partner, Steve, um, uh, didn't do a lot of work on this screenplay. I'm you know, I'm OK with telling people uh, that. Our uh, our relationship as a as a writing duo, you know, we d- uh, we also did Space Jam together and. Um, I did most of the work and uh, Steve's role on this screenplay was describing um, describing uh, the, the more subtle stuff like, uh, you know, this character takes five steps to this location. This character, you know, uh, bends his arm like this, like really uh, subtle and, and meaningless body uh, body language stuff. Yeah, but you need that for Tim. I mean, the guy do, yeah. is incapable of doing anything without direction. So see those blinks? I remember we. I remember that was in the script. Uh, those blinking of the eyes. Um, he's he's got to know, and you know, uh, start of every scene. You know, you got to put in. You know, breathe. You know, or you know, with instructions, got to say while breathing. Yeah. And uh, normally, yeah, on Steve's uh, kind of style of, you know, really uh, uh, explicit stage direction, usually that all gets thrown out. But um, on this film, because Tim Allen was really adhering to it very closely, this was actually his favorite uh, film that he worked on, Steve. And um, 
he uh i believe on the sequels added a uh, a lot more you know uh detailed uh stage direction things like you know don't think about uh a dragon and uh you know age five minutes and things like that and uh tim allen stuck to it and all the other actors ignored it mm. and um that is uh i think part of the reason why he continues to work this day and i don't yeah but uh oh so we just had a little bit of uh that game that we came up with that really caught on called soccer uh, yeah yeah uh we were just like what, what's a silly game that kids could play and we we're like uh i don't know and i think someone looked down at their socks and they're like uh soccer and we we're like well, well how would soccer go and then we we're like well, uh, well let's see uh, you gotta have your shoes and uh, what do you do with your shoes a uh, you, you, you kick something you kick a ball uh, it's like basketball but on the ground and yeah that's how we came up with soccer and then you know it, it just blew up it just became a, a whole thing yeah well we uh you know we i think we knew we had a good game on our hands and we got in touch with hasbro and they started mass producing the balls and uh you know there was a big uh ad campaign that kind of tied in with the movie soccer new you know so that's uh yeah that's where it all began yeah yeah every kid that year wanted to have a, a soccer ball Now, if you notice, he's starting to dress a little bit like Santa Claus. He's got the red and the white. Right. And by which you're, you mean the, the guy in the background there, you know? It, yes. The, yeah. The guy who's a bit out of focus. Like you, you can kind of see him. He's uh, he's on the he's through the one of the windows of the house there. Um, he's he's starting to look a little bit like Santa. I mean, you, you see him looking through the windows and a lot of the other shots. But uh, in in this one, it's it's really clear that you know he's got the red and the white yeah in the screenplay he's only named uh the man who watches tim allen from afar mm. and uh he's just kind of described in the background of a lot of shots and his his story is basically that he's watching the events of the film and interpreting them and uh it's affecting the way he's dressing and uh by the end of the film um he is also dressed like santa claus and but he never leaves his house. Right, right. Sort of a, a reverse Santa. Uh, you know, Santa travels all over the world. And uh, this this shadow Santa, if you will, uh, doesn't leave his house. Mm hmm. And he actually destroys toys. Right, right. But not a lot because they have to be uh, delivered to his house. Oh, speaking of which, <laughs> uh, here are uh, here is this scene of the the great delivery now all those boxes actually only have uh how many they only have five sides to them the backs are just open we did that to save money mm. luckily they're all pointed away from the camera so you can't see that all these boxes are just missing one surface basically right right which was which was hard to film um mm -hmm. Uh, so what we did was we brought in a studio audience and we said, OK, uh, who wants to watch a TV show? And they're like, all right. Yeah. They're like, who wants to help out with the TV show? And they're like, uh, what? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whenever we had to move the camera, we'd say, all right, come on down and rotate the boxes. And these these people came and they they rotated the boxes whenever we needed them to. And uh, by the time they figured out that there was no TV show, um they had all just passed out from exhaustion so it was fine yeah but they all got a credit so mm -hmm. no worries yeah of course it's uh in the spirit of the film it's in a uh, very fine print and a border around the actual credits uh, you know just a little little well, meta <laughs> if you will you know yep oh uh, there's all right so this is the yeah this is the scene where tim allen uh judges people's souls Right, right. We we now establish that he is a, an omniscient being that can stay into people's past, presence, and and future. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he is also uh, undesirable uh, sexually, and so that that backfires for him. He cannot use his omniscience uh, to his own benefit. 
Yeah, that's one of the things that we ended up changing in the sequels was making him uh, more of a sexually attractive character. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like that about this first movie that he is, uh, he's not very lucky uh, with, uh, with the dating. And uh, it, it never really holds him back as Santa Claus, but um, uh, that goes back to the original screenplay where he was in a happy relationship with his ex-wife and her new husband. Yeah. So people always misinterpret this part. See, they, they think that the, the main conflict here is that, you know, these, these other parents, they're concerned that Tim Allen's character is becoming Santa. They're really just concerned that he is aging prematurely uh, due to his own mental belief in Santa Claus. And they are afraid that uh, he won't be able to support his child anymore because he will just crumble into dust uh, because of his uh, false beliefs. Yeah, this was a this was a real concern a lot of people had in the 1990s, uh, which was just uh, people were aging rapidly with no real reason. And uh, in the end, we figured out it was due to the Internet and um I think the FDA kind of stepped in and fixed whatever was causing people to age so quickly um, with all the, the, the new cable lines being put down. Um, but uh, yeah, at the time that was kind of the subtext was, uh, you know, they were worried that uh, she's worried that the father of her son is, uh, is uh, about to turn into dust. And uh, that was one of the, the more, you know, real and heart wrenching aspects of this story that I think grounded it a lot. Hmm. Now, we never really explain why the mom here never got her mystery date game. And the the backstory of it is that Santa Claus is asexual, or at least the, the previous Santa Claus, you know, the one that Tim Allen murders. The previous one mm -hmm. was asexual and will not gift anything that, you know, even implies anything of human sexuality. So that includes a mystery date game. And the same is true of the Weedy Whistle. Um, it's, it, Santa would not, the previous Santa would never, you know, deliver that to little kids because it's way too phallic. Yeah. Oh, well, that's one of the unspoken rules of Santa Claus is that he'll never give you something that he wouldn't accept himself. Mm, right. And that's still true of, uh, of the Tim Allen version of, of Santa Claus. You don't see him giving out a lot of toys in this movie, at least not until the end. Uh, but if you pay attention, there are all things that, I think his character would uh, also want himself for Christmas. Absolutely. I remember uh, the whole time we were filming, he's like, I can finally do it. I can finally afford to buy a kayak. I've, I've been saving my whole life and I can finally get one. Yep. And, uh, you know, he gives, I think he gives some kids a, a set of power tools later in the movie and, that was definitely, you know, that was Tim's idea, actually. He's like, hey, what if I gave him some power tools? And we thought, like, wow, yeah, that's perfect, Mr. Allen. Yeah. Uh, all my movies, I always make sure to write a scene where the main character uh, watches his family from outside through the window. Right. And sometimes, you know, it's just in the middle of a scene. Like, I've seen some of the films, like... Uh, you know, the, the everyone's sitting around like, how was your day, son? And the son was like, well, today we had the science fair. And then in the middle of that, the dad just gets up, walks outside, looks through the window at the son as the son continues to tell everyone else in the in the family about his science fair project. Yep. And if you recall, in, uh, we did it in Space Jam as well. There's a scene where Wayne Knight visits his family in the middle of the movie and just kind of sighs and watches them through the window and then heads back down to Space Jam World. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, really grounds the film and really just reminds mm -hmm. you what's at stake. Now here, the boy is starting to believe that his own father is Santa. Yes. Uh... Which actually is based on something that happened to me as a child. Oh, okay. Um, I, don't know if you... I had a similar experience, but you go first. Oh, I'm sure it's more common than we realize. But uh, yeah, as a kid, even though my father looked nothing at all like Santa Claus, 
uh, at some point I just became convinced that he was Santa Claus and that he was the one leaving toys under the tree. And, uh, and, uh, you know, he'd, uh, he'd spend, you know, weeks away from our family and, uh, and I would just kind of get, oh, he must be making toys, you know, and he'd, and he'd come home and, uh, have, uh, you know, some presents and a beard and, I, you know, it makes sense. I, I just figured, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess it's Santa Claus. And, uh, you know, I forgot all of that. And then I, you know, I grew up and I, I kind of drew on a lot of that for the screenplay for this. Yeah. What's your, what's your story? Oh, well, um, so I, I, uh, I grew up with, uh, two mothers, you know, um, and I, I guess this is somewhat similar, but you know, whenever they would kiss, in the negative space in between them, it was in the shape of Santa Claus. And so I was convinced that they were actually just the, basically the embodiment of Santa. Like they, they, they sort of like uh, Captain Planet, if you will, like whenever they kissed, they, they brought Santa into existence. So that, that was, that was my belief, but it turns out that they were actually just summoning the Easter bunny. Ah, okay. Yeah. So interesting. <laughs> uh, the foolishness of childhood, right? The things we used to believe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Easter Bunny was going to be in this film at one point. Yeah, I remember he was going to go to a support group of people that had become various holiday icons. You know, there was a man who was becoming Cupid. Um, there was a guy who was becoming Arbor Day Allen. I'm pretty sure that happens in the third movie. I I don't exactly remember. Yeah. Um, but uh kind of a that that part of my life was kind of a blur, but yeah, we definitely get into the other holiday people in the later movies. Mm. But uh ultimately in this one, I think it was a smart move to just focus on Christmas, don't even acknowledge the other days. Just Christmas, Christmas, Christmas and um uh that works. It really makes it feel like a very driven focused movie um and uh it makes it feel more like a christmas movie than uh any of the other movies that don't even mention christmas yeah although a, a fun thing and people have realized this throughout the years it's no secret but if you cover just the right half of the screen and watch the film and it's going to be in widescreen format but if you cover just the right half of the screen it becomes a ramadan film it's uh, a great little, you know, visual trick throughout. That is impressive. Yeah, your DP is uh, d deserved that Oscar. Absolutely. Now, here we go. We got Bernard back finally. Finally. Yeah. So here we are uh, solving the age old issue of, you know, why, uh, why doesn't Santa catch on fire? Yeah, I, I felt compelled. I mean, this is the first big post Gulf war Santa Claus movie. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to incorporate some of the, you know, like, in, you know, the, uh, advancements in technology and, uh, you know, body armor that, uh, that had come around. Yeah. So, uh, this is all that coming to fruition. Right. And uh, yeah, so we, we've got the new Santa suit here, the the flame retardant one. And, um, you know, originally they were going to the cops here, is, you know, we're kind of building up to it. The cops are going to fight him with flamethrowers. We thought that would be a good finale. Oh, uh, that synchronized yeah. little dance there. Um, I uh, that is something that Tim Allen insisted on. And I, I said, what is the point of this? And he said that that's what Santa does. That's what he does when he's going out to deliver presents. And I, I asked him to explain it. And he just he did that movement again. And he said, I've seen it. I've seen it again and again and again. I've you know, you can't tell me that this is not part of what Santa does. And I just trusted him and I wish I hadn't because it is it is the worst part of the film. I just want to cry. Yeah, that's every one time of the things. It. Yeah, everyone mentions Tim Allen's uh, Santa dance as a, as a con for the film. Usually that's the only real negative that they bring up uh, aside from the uh, the reindeer. But um, 
yeah, I agree. It's not great. No. I uh, I made sure to in the the sequels in every scene, uh, we we have a line that that basically says Santa does not dance. Right. As kind of just like a preemptive uh, measure to make sure that didn't happen again. Hmm. As you can see, Santa was heading off to the moon, obviously alluding to another scene that got cut out where he, you know, delivers all of the presents to the moon and then realizes that he's reading his list upside down and he has to go uh, back and get them and, you know, deliver them to the right people. So. Now, people ask, you know, so to, to his news, this this his first year as Santa Claus, he's got all this technology. How did the first Santa function without it? And uh, basically, the idea is that uh, the original Santa wasn't very good at all. Um, no. He just uh, wasn't really capable of delivering presents and uh you know, parents were really the ones that were delivering gifts the whole the whole time and just saying, you know, it was Santa, but not really. And so this is really the first time that a Santa Claus has ever been successful. Yeah, I actually I wanted to make that explicit with a, a text crawl at the beginning of the film that would just explain that, oh, you know, the year is 1993. Santa Claus is only able to deliver presents to, you know, children on the coast and, you know, parts of Canada. And, um, in the end, I don't think it was necessary. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we are, we are going to follow him, you know, in real time to show, you know, it, it truly is impossible for Santa to do, you know, true, uh, you know, the, the legendary amount of gift giving, but that would have taken, uh, several, several hours, you know, over the course of a, a day, so we, we we decided not to. Now, the milk that he drinks in this scene is actually uh, water with paint in it. Right, right. Um, Remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. T Tim Allen insists on only drinking drinks that have paint in it. So we had to do that, uh, you know, because he's he's all about his tools. And, you know, what, what goes with tools, you know, paint. So he's got to gotta have his paint you know make him a real you know tool man it was a big deal on the show right he would drink a different color of paint every episode and it was kind of uh how you'd uh i, th I think like the episode titles were the paint colors that he would drink right yeah yeah you had your uh your mauve episode you know your lime green episode i always thought it was because you were sponsored by home depot but uh this movie is not and yet there he is drinking that paint so i guess it was just that's just his thing huh yeah yeah in fact in in honor of uh you know the way that we used to name the uh home improvement episodes after the color of paint that he was drinking uh tim allen wanted this movie to just be called white but then uh, we told him no. And he was like, what about like eggshell or, you know, you know, Snow White or something? And we said, no, there's there's already a movie called Snow White. And then again, he insisted that there that there wasn't. And then uh, we showed him Snow White and then he said, I can make a better Snow White. And then we had to halt production while he frame by frame drew an entire new Snow White out of crayons. And that is actually the version that is on Disney Plus now. They uh, they actually decided that it was better looking than the original. And uh, now Tim Allen is the sole credited animator on Snow White. Look yeah, it yeah, it's interesting. Hmm. I'm, I, I'm glad that this made it into the final movie. I really wanted to have a scene where Santa got arrested and had to be rescued by his elves. Mm -hmm. And I was so worried that that Disney wouldn't be cool with it. Uh, they were luckily, but um, I think the backup plan uh, for this part of the movie, in case they weren't cool with showing Santa be arrested, uh, we were planning on having a uh, Santa get caught in a bear trap uh, in the basement of his own house. Right, right, right. 
And uh, that was when we were going to reveal that Santa actually bleeds hot chocolate. You know, another little quirky mm-hmm. thing, you know, it's a holiday. Oh, Santa doesn't have blood. He's got hot chocolate, you know, and hot chocolate would be squirting everywhere. And he'd be going, help me, help me, help me. And they like take a little like, you know, taste of his own blood and go, hmm, milk chocolate. But, you know, instead we got to work with um, uh, this actor uh, whose name is Fred. Yeah. And he actually uh, went on to play Santa Claus in uh, Santa Claus the Movie 2. Mm, yes. Which was produced by DreamWorks and has the exact same plot as this movie. Yeah. Which... Uh, personally, I am flattered by. I think it's great when other movies use uh, the, the, a plot that I wrote. It's happened several times, and it's actually an honor. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just wish it wasn't a shot-for-shot shot remake. Um, it just uh, it just felt a little bit derivative. I mean, I don't want to criticize other people, but yeah. Um, and the fact that they put my name on the film, even though I didn't direct it, uh, it didn't seem quite fair, but you know, I'm, I'm flattered, you know, good for them. I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah. That's just, uh, that's just the industry, I guess. Yeah. What are you going to do now? How did you get these kids to fly? Oh boy. Okay. So what you do for a scene like this, they are on, it's not them that's flying. It's actually the set that's falling. Okay. So you, okay, you yeah. have this, you know, basically you go to like a canyon or somewhere really, really deep. OK, and then uh, you, you build this set over it and then you basically have a trap door. OK, and what you're seeing is actually a free fall. OK, of all that street and everything is falling down. And that's that's how you do that old Hollywood trick. All right, so so we've been a little bit quiet because this is extremely, extremely important dialogue. And, you know, even if you've seen this movie before, we want to make sure that you understand that he is, as, as it was described, the Calvin boy. Um, we found yes. that with test audiences, a lot of times they didn't realize that he is Tim Allen's son. They just kept forgetting. Like every time he was in a new scene, uh, you know, the test audience would be like, who is he and what is his relation? And we told them, oh, he's he's the boy from the previous scene. He's he's uh, Tim Allen's son. And they'd say, oh, OK. Yeah, but they actually they actually liked ha- being reminded of that fact. Every time that we bring up that he is Tim Allen's son, they treat it like a big twist in the movie. And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, they kept know? saying that is so clever. How did you come up with that? And, you know, we just sort of shrug and say, oh, you know. These things come to us. <laughs> uh, but it was my idea also to have the elves kind of uh, pee wrapping paper. And uh, uh, I'm glad that made it in because uh, pee stuff was really huge in the early 90s. Yeah. Once again, you know, the Christmas biology thing of, you know, Santa yeah, yeah. has hot chocolate blood and elves, you know, they urinate uh, you know, the, the wrappings there. And, uh, we're also going to have it so that, uh, every time Santa cries, his, his tears, uh, spell out Christmas in Morse code, but that, that didn't really, uh, that didn't really happen. No, you can't really see the tears. No, but, uh, he is, he is crying in quite a lot of these scenes. Uh, but, uh, even in uh, pretty much the whole movie. Yeah. 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 Basically. But even in high definition, it doesn't really come across. And I, I blame the lighting department for that. Was the, I, so I never gave it a good tug, but the beard was real, right? Uh, it was. Uh, we we sewed that to his face. Um, it's uh, it's laced into his face there um mm-hmm. and 
you know, once the the bleeding stopped, it just it just looked so real. It was great. And uh, yeah, we we trim that from uh, actually we trim that beard off of Tim Allen. Uh, funny thing, uh, because again, oh, it, was, it was his hit. Yeah, it, it was his beard hair. Um, we uh, we we had him grow out the beard and then we shaved it, you know, and then uh, we reassembled it and uh, then we filmed the seams without him having a beard. And then we 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 weaved it again, sewed it to his face um, and filmed these scenes. And it, it just it was a time saver was what it was. I know that on the uh, on the sequels, you weren't able to get him to grow the the initial hair again. Right. So you had to you had to clip it off of um, was it Wilford Brimley, maybe uh, some, some other actor. It, it, some of it was Wilford Brimley. Uh, some of it was actually uh, Randy Newman, uh, not typically an actor, uh, but, you mm -hmm. know, great beard donor uh, it really has helped out a lot of productions. Uh, you know, he's got a very, when he grows out his, uh, his hair, not his beard, but his hair actually grows out the shape of Santa's beard. So he'll then, you know, trim it and donate it to various Santa Claus productions, whether it be a movie, TV show, even some, you know, some higher class mall Santas. Ah, yeah. It's a good side gig for him. Yeah. Yeah. In between, you know, the great music that he creates. Now, the composer for this film actually is Randy Newman's uh, uh, younger brother, uh, Tim Newman, mm -hmm. who uh, was, I think, only eight when he composed this score. Is that right? Yeah, he composed the whole score. I um, mean, you know, it was originally written entirely on triangle. Um, he composed the whole thing on a triangle. And then, of course, it was uh, translated to the, the the more fully instrumental score that you hear here. But yeah, the, the sheet music was all, you know, just triangle. And it uh, sort of expanded from there in the recording session. Yeah, they're a really talented family. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the actually that's the actual screenplay being burned. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And we said, uh, you know, throw away your lines. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to wing it from here. You know, we're just getting so everything that you see from this point onward was just improvised. Uh, we didn't know mm -hmm. how this was going to end. Uh, we, we truly didn't. I mean, the improv is in the script. It literally says and then mom throws the script on the on the fire. And there was just a little asterisk and said, improvise the rest. Yeah, and boy, they this scene just went on and on and on and on. Um, at times, you know, it uh, it became an opera. They all started singing opera, and then uh, it suddenly became a hostage situation. And then uh, they were explaining to the little boy at one point uh, what exactly a turkey was because he didn't understand. And then they had to sort of make a turkey out of uh, the household objects that were around them. And I mean, when we said improvise, they really, really took it to heart. Oh, yeah. Most of it had to be cut out, but we were able to yeah, get a functioning scene out of it, luckily. Yeah. All of this was improvised, too. All the uh, the cop actors and they brought their own cars and uh, just kind of threw together this uh, this siege on uh, Tim Allen's house. And yeah. uh, this is usually not the kind of, yeah, you usually need a lot of pre-production to pull this kind of scene off, but you just, uh, just called up a bunch of actors and said, Hey, do your thing. And, uh, they showed up. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> they've got the, the guy with the sniper rifle there. That was his idea. And then of course, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he started firing it wildly and we thought that was really funny, but you know, Disney made us cut that out. Mm-hmm. And there's, uh, you know, there's our goblins again, another bit of the mythology we weren't able to get into. And uh, yeah, the street goblins. Yeah, yeah. I oh, think they're pointing at the reindeer. Oh, yeah, gone. Oh, you, you think that Santa, you know, has just flown away and that's it. Uh, but, we, you know, again, just improvising. Tim was like, no, 
they need to know I need to go back. And so he, he went back. But go ahead. Oh, yeah, just like the children were, uh, it looks like they're pointing at the reindeer, but in reality, we just kind of, uh, um, uh, we're taking a bunch of food that we had gotten from the corner store, and we were kind of throwing it up in the air, and uh, the guy with the sniper rifle was, uh, you know, kind of shooting, you know, salami and stuff up in the air, and the, the kids were pointing at it and saying, look at that, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. It's a Christmas miracle, yeah. Yeah, looking at, uh, you know, Twinkies being shot midair and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and wouldn't you know it it's the weenie whistle yep the mystery uh, date yep the uh the two you know sexual gifts that santa previously santa 1.0 we don't know if it was he's the first santa but the previous santa you know um you know another thing that we uh, we didn't get around to in the sequels was the idea that every year there is a new santa every year Santa is killed and replaced, you know? So this is, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, hundred and, you know, 50,000th Santa or whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, one of the dropped characters from the screenplay was the specter of Santa death, who would kind of be uh, taunting Tim Allen throughout the film and saying like, you're next and stuff like that. And then at the end of the movie, he'd be on a roof and the specter would appear and, uh, and uh reach out his hand and the film would the last shot of the film was uh, was tim allen taking the hand of of death right just a nice close-up yeah yeah and at the bottom of the screen it said put on your 3d glasses now and the audience would be like oh that's why the 3d glasses are here you know as the the hand of death reached out to them so mm -hmm. now unfortunately i think uh the beginning of the movie, you know, there is there was a message that said, like, when when you see the text that says put on glasses now, put on your 3D glasses. And we put out the film and we uh, included 3D glasses, you know, with every ticket. And uh, that text never comes up. So nobody ever put on the 3D glasses. Uh, and I that was brought up in some reviews, but most people didn't seem to mind at all. They just liked holding and fiddling with the glasses throughout the the runtime of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. And uh some people actually uh ate the glasses. Um and they claimed that it tasted a little bit like gingerbread, but I, I, I we never told them to do that nor did we insert anything into the glasses that tasted like gingerbread so i think that was just the magic of the film that made them think that the 3d glasses Maybe, were yeah. a cookie you know i yeah unfortunately there's no way to find out now right because they, they've pretty much all been eaten by fans throughout the years and there he goes now what city is that um, that is a town in Lithuania, um, and it was dirt cheap to film there, and, um, it just, the whole town is actually concave, so it just made it a lot easier to film, uh, because we, we basically mm -hmm. just had to just walk to the edge of this town, and then, uh, we could just film easily above it, because the, the whole thing was just below us. So that's that's why we did that. Yeah, actually, yeah, I remember they we could get up even a little bit higher because they had a big pole you could kind of shimmy up mm. that they in the old days would use to uh, to to kill uh, corrupt mayors oh, in yeah. this town. So you just would kind of like step over all these old skeletons with the camera, and you just shimmy up there, and we got our coverage, and uh, it looks great, great, great final shot absolutely and there's our, our fun font again but you'll notice that the mm -hmm. office font the like the typewriter font isn't there anymore and that was our way of saying you know like leave your old life behind you know leave your family leave your son just 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 do christmas year round you know people really misunderstand yeah. you know the whole message of uh a Christmas carol of like hold Christmas in your heart year round. Like, no, really do it. Don't provide for your family. Don't go to your job. Don't live in a, in a house in America, you know, go and become Santa Claus. You need to yeah, abandon everything. That is the true. 
that's the true heart of the movie you know like that's that scott calvin is dead you know he doesn't have to look after his son or help out in any way anymore and this is uh one of the i think one of the great pro abandonment films uh at least in you know in the mainstream mm. um and uh i think it's it's yeah it's a big part of the christmas magic and the allure of santa the fantasy of santa which is leaving it all behind yeah just, just going and making toys just working one day a year uh just goodbye to your family no responsibilities you got elves and reindeer doing everything for you just get fat and that's it mm -hmm. i mean well to be fair and we don't show this in the movies so much but a lot of his duties year round managing the elves and inv involves a lot of like union busting and stuff like that so it's it's not a one day a year kind of thing to be fair to santa claus yeah but and then we were gonna have him build the union busting robot you know so you know that mm -hmm. was a whole thing but uh you know it's, it's yeah that it's, was a budget problem yeah. it's a shame you know t you know all these sequels that we have now you know there's like 15 sequels and then uh, about eight spin-off films and, and there's still parts of the mythology that we haven't touched upon yet yeah i mean not a lot of people know this but i i did uh ghost write a bunch of the sequels uh i'm only credited on the first on two and three or two and x sorry uh we went with x for the third movie for some reason but uh um the direct -to video there's like something like 10 of them and i uh had a hand in writing some of them at least i forget how many because I made sure to uh, to get uh, very high and drunk for for my uh, my my uh, screenwriting duties for these movies, and it definitely that definitely comes through in the later movies. But yeah, that's why just like each film is more and more of a blur. Yeah, these are actually not our credits. Um, this is actually the credits for a different film. We didn't have time to finish this off. So these are actually the credits oh, right. for uh, the African Queen 2, Back to Africa. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. You know what? That happens a lot, though. Wrong credits. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no one really notices, typically. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, most of the cast and crew is the same anyway. So whatever. Yeah. Uh, and who wrote that song at the end, by the way? Was that Randy Newman as well? Uh, well, you could kind of say uh, the Beatles wrote it. It's actually just uh, Let It Be Backwards. Um, if you play, we found uh, out if you okay. play the song backwards, it just sounds like that. So <laughs> it's kind of a, a fun way to get around copyright and around, you know, having to pay someone for a song. Yeah. Yeah. Empty to tell. I'm trying to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that was our movie. Thanks for listening to our commentary track. Uh, do you have any final words, John? Uh, my final words are, uh, I gotta go get Tim that frozen mayonnaise I promised him because he's, he's banging at the door. All right. Well, yeah, tell him I said hi and, uh, looking forward to, uh, Santa Claus, uh, I think 15 is coming out this Christmas. So, uh, 15 and a half. Definitely, uh, 15 and a half. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll, well see you. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say the same thing, which is uh, see you this Christmas. Yep. See you at the movies. Bye, everyone. Bye.